Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cultivate Your Success podcast. My name is Colleen Cavanaugh, and today I have an excellent, excellent surprise for you all. Oh, boy. Let me tell you, I have been wanting to interview one of my stunt friends for a long time. And here today, I have with us on the call, Dave Buglioni. <laughs> I can, I don't know. I'm so sorry, Dave, if I totally messed that up. But this is Dave, everyone. Um, so thank you, Dave, for coming on. Now, real quick for our listeners, Dave, David Anthony Buglioni, he is um, originally from New York and he has a martial arts background. He's been doing martial arts since he was five years old. He's, he's been in many commercials and TV shows. He has a black belt in, in martial arts in Kempo to be exact. And he also is a kickboxer, a world champion. So I'll have you go uh, tell us more about that, David. But most recently, you can see Dave at different, different movies. Most recently, season three of Marvel's Daredevil as playing FBI agent Johnson. And he's also been in The Accountant. And he's got a Netflix uh, coming up. He's got something coming up on Netflix. So... That's just a little bit, a little fraction of what Dave has done. So Dave's going to be speaking with us today about how to get into stunts and acting in general. So Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. And you did a pretty good job with my name. So that was pretty good. <laughs> okay. That's, that's always a tough, I'm sure you're used to it, huh? That Italian oh. uh, something. Okay. Well, goodness. Where should we even start, Dave? Should we start? How did you even get into martial arts or into the stunt world to begin with? Well, I mean, um, I just started at martial arts when I was six years old. Uh, my grandfather just wanted me to stay busy, you know, thought it would be something, you know, fun for me to do. And I uh, started taking karate lessons at six years old and, um, you know, worked my way up, finally got my black belt at 16. But ever since I was a kid, everybody always asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? And um, I was always like, I want to be a movie star, an action star, you know? And um, you know, 16, I started fighting amateur. Um, I was a professional kickboxer. At 18, I turned pro. And 19, I was the youngest member of the WAKO WACO kickboxing team. Um, I went over to Gdansk, Poland, and I fought in the world championships over there. And then three years later, I became the US KBA World Welterweight Champion. Now, I know this is a podcast, but if, you know, if there is a video out there, and oh. we can make it into a video. Oh, look at the, that. I brought the belt along here. Oh, and, yes. Uh, yes. Something just to, you know, tease our listeners out there. But Absolutely. here is the belt. <laughs> oh, that's a nice. I love those big belts. Those are great. So, yes, if you're listening to my podcast, you can go over to uh, my YouTube channel and, and possibly uh, yours as well. And we'll, we'll see if you prefer to listen on YouTube, too. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. That, and you got that belt win. How old? Uh, I was 22 at the time. Okay. Yeah, I was a US KBA World World Away champion. And then, you know, I, I, I was in the game for the fight game for a long time. Again, I started martial arts when I was six years old. But, you know, I kind of made it to that level of becoming, you know, world champion. And, you know, I just kind of, you know, closed that chapter in my life and always wanted to be into the movie business, always wanted to get into the movie business. I didn't know how to get into the movie business. but um, one thing led to another where I started training actors how to do fight scenes. I, uh, you know, I was personal training them. Uh, I was teaching them how to kick and punch for TV and film. And one thing led to another where, you know, the producers and directors were like, you know, this is taking way too much time. Can't you just do it? <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's so awesome. And I'm sure you having that world kickboxing champion uh, belt behind you that probably also helped a little bit and and just your skills and your athletes you know your your athleticism oh my gosh so yeah that's great so when you say you were working with different actors uh, was it out like prominent actors would you say or something like b b or like what no kind it was of all pretty much all a-list actors okay and uh you know just training them uh, i was a personal trainer I, you know i went to school for health and uh, education so you know i have a degree in that as well i went to hofstra university out on long island um so you know i have a background in you know nutrition and stuff as well and uh, like I said, one thing led to another where it was just taking too much time. And the director's like, can't you just do it? I said, 
well, I don't look like the guy. They go, don't worry, just go to hair and makeup and you'll look like him. I came out two seconds later from hair and makeup. I had no hair on my head and I looked exactly like the main actor. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I love. You know, I wanted to talk about that, and uh, and we'll, we can get into it, but I love talking about the magic of movie making, and and I know I've been on on a, a few a few stunt training and independent films myself with some of you guys from Orlando, of Fi and Jupe and all those guys, and, and even I, I myself worked on a low-budget show, but it's funny when you work on these TV and films, that you really see the magic of movie making, but even more so with stunts. Oh yeah. Tell mm -hmm. us, can you tell our listeners something like uh, like a secret maybe we should know about stunts or anything in general? Or actually? Yeah, make sure you bring your pad bag and make sure you wear pads. <laughs> yeah, bring your, own, bring your own stuff. If you're gonna go audition or if you've gotten the role, bring your own protection because they might not have it there for you, huh? Okay. Exactly, exactly. That's great advice for our future stunt people who are listening. Uh, whether and you even and yeah. if, I, if I can interrupt you, even as an actor, yeah. I've learned that I've learned, you know, throughout my years of being in this business, you know, I'm starting to do a lot more acting stuff now, but I still, I'll bring my own pad bag. I'll still bring my own elbow pads. I'll still bring my own knee pads because A, I'm not going to rely on anybody else to do that. And B, I want to be safe and I want to be able to fully commit to the role as an actor. So, you know, wearing an elbow pad or, you know, a knee pad, it doesn't make you, you know, less of a man or less of a woman. It's just, it just makes it easier for you to really connect with the character and really engage in that character. And you don't really have to worry about, you know, bumping an elbow or bumping a knee or hurting yourself. It just makes you, you know, forget about that. And it just, you know, you can just focus on the acting and it's, it's just one little bit of advice. I, you know, I'll, I'll tell all my actors, bring your own, bring your own stuff. It, yes. it makes a huge difference. Yeah, and then you, if they do throw in something, hey, can you do like a fall here? And then that way you don't have to say, oh no, and then they might end up getting somebody else and you'd probably rather just do your own simple, if it's just something simple, like a simple, I say a fall, meaning like not from up high, but you know, <laughs> something. Yeah, no, simple. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Always be ready. And there's, okay. a, there's, a, there's a nice easy quote, you know, be ready so you don't have to get ready. Okay, there you go. So, oh my gosh, we could just go on. I love, I love talking about this. And when I wanted to do my podcast a couple of years ago, uh, I was actually leaning more towards the entertainment because I knew I had all, so many cool people like you that I wanted to interview. And a lot of people don't really know many stunt people and they don't know what goes on behind the stunt world in the stunt world. Can you tell us like what was one of mo maybe the most dangerous a stunt or movies you've worked in or maybe the most exciting, you know, is there uh, anything that stands out? I mean, I've done pretty much every gag that's out there. You know, I've done full fire burns, you know, I've done car stuff, car wrecks. Um, but the craziest one was working on Southpaw with Jake Gyllenhaal. And uh, I don't know if everybody remembers the scene. There's no spoiler alerts out there because the movie is a couple of years old already. But um, when Jake Gyllenhaal takes his uh, Mercedes S550, and he tries to kill himself in the movie and he takes it and he slams it straight into a tree outside of his house. So um, it was kind of nerve wracking because they kept on putting that scene off and off. It was supposed to happen in the beginning of the movie and then it kept on getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And then the nerves started setting in and I was just like, okay, could we just do this thing already? <laughs> and it wasn't until the last day of the movie, the last shot, so, and that movie took about three months to make. So just imagine going, when am I gonna do this? When am I gonna do this? Finally, at like two o'clock in the morning on the last shot of, uh, you know, the last shot, the martini shot, as I like to call it. It was like, all right, Dave, you're up. You got one shot to do this. I'm like, all right. So I asked, <laughs> I, I went over and I talked to my boss and I said, hey, do you have any advice for me? He goes, yeah, just don't miss the tree. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, uh, doing a, like you are running into a tree, you know, you're just, what other protection did you have besides just normal, I guess, airbags that are supposed to go off? Like, and how fast were you going when you had to hit the tree? Well, yeah, we do, you know, we do all the calculations and we take that all into consideration. Uh, they didn't want me to wear a neck, a neck brace because they wanted to, you know, see the impact from outside of the car and they wanted to see, you know, Jake slumped over. 
So, you know, I put a five point uh, harness on, a uh, seatbelt, five point, uh, uh, they call it a five point harness. So it's locked in at five points and it really keeps you locked into the seat, you know, and um, just, you know, making sure your thumbs are on the outside of the wheel. Uh, this way, when you do hit impact, your, you know, your wrists don't, yeah, this way your wrists don't break. Uh, so you want to really just brace yourself, get your head back into that seat and, you know, just go along for the ride. <laughs> oh boy, you know, there might be a reason they left that shot until the end. They're like, we don't want our, our, our stunt man to get hurt because if he gets hurt, we don't have the other shots, right? <laughs> I didn't say it. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh boy, that's those are tough. The 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 driving was something like that. Yeah. Wow. Now, did you take? Uh, have you taken some stunt driving courses as well? Did you work on um, the uh, Fast and Furious ones? Did you? No, I never got to work on any of the the Fast and Furiouses. Actually, no, I do take that back. I did some work down in I think it was Fast and the Furious Two down in Miami. Okay. That's when I was still living on the East Coast. Um, then, you know, then I moved out to LA and yeah, but I think, I think it was Fast and Furious 2 that I did, I did okay. some stunt driving. Yeah, because I know a lot of the guys from Orlando did that. So yeah. uh, they did a lot of, yeah, that was great. So, okay. So, and you've done fire burns, you've done high falls, I'm sure. Uh, like what are, how do you do your high falls? Tell, I mean, we're going to, we're going to give a little secret out for those. Like, how are you doing a high fall and how do you land? What kind of equipment are you using to stay safe when you're landing? Again, this goes back to what I asked my boss when I was driving that tree. Do you have any advice? Yeah, look at your mark and don't miss the bag. <laughs> yeah, don't miss the bag. Oh, gosh. I remember when I took that stunt workshop out in uh, Kissimmee with Fi and them, and we had to jump from, I think, 20 feet high into that big airbag. And I have never had, like, gymnastics or anything like that, but that was kind of scary, and it's all about landing in the you know landing and knowing your body in space right yeah. you, had to do mm -hmm. a lot of you just want to keep you just want to keep your eye on the mark and that's it and just head straight towards it oh and usually you know usually there's a big cross or a big you know exactly. plus mark yeah in the uh, in the middle of the bag which you want to aim for so as long as you keep your eyes on that you're good to go <laughs> wow wow so what i want to talk a little bit about uh, your nutrition habits and your in your exercise habits but before we go into that i also want to ask you what should we tell our listeners for any actors out there young actors or somebody who might want to get into stunts uh, first or and or acting what should be some of the first steps they should be taking right now to prepare themselves for auditions for stunts great question um I always go back to, you know, having a base, a base of something. My base was martial arts. So a lot of people that are in the industry, um, they either have a strong gymnastics background, a huge martial arts background, whether it's MMA, karate, taekwondo, anything like that, even a huge, you know, motorcycle, like drag racing and, um, you know, car stuff. So, you know, you'll have your, your, uh, your professional drivers, you know, um, so, you know, that's their specialty. Always have some kind of specialty. Always try to bring something to the table. Like I said, maybe it's, you know, water. Maybe you're a lifeguard. Maybe you're great on boats and jet skis, you know, and maybe you were a, yeah, like a former ocean rescue lifeguard or something. So use that and use that to make money, you know, so use that and let that make you you know help you survive you know what i mean and then take you know take some of that money that you're making off those gigs whether if it's you know if you're a strong martial artist or anything like that and then take that money and then start reinvesting into yourself so then go out and take a driving class you know for a weekend they usually have like two or three day you know driving classes you know go out and get patty certified scuba you know go out and um i don't take a gymnastics class if that's not your if that's on your background, but just always reinvest your into yourself and you'll see the gains. And then instead of just having one, now you are a martial artist that is a scuba certi uh, certified, you know, scuba diver. And now you have two things where you can start, you know, pulling income from. And then again, take that money, reinvest, learn something else. And now you have three different traits. So you always want to kind of just reinvest into yourself. Absolutely. I agree. And pretty much in any industry that people need to learn how to do that, but especially in this, because it is probably competitive. Would you say this is a very competitive acting? We know is stunts just as competitive. 
Oh yeah, I mean you have the you know some of the best drivers out there, you know some of the best martial artists out there. So you know it is com you know it is competitive. Uh, okay, well I know um, I'm I'm based out of Tampa, so a lot of my listeners might be in the Florida area. So would you say maybe working, at, maybe auditioning at one of the theme parks in Orlando, uh, or or even Bush Gardens, would that be a good way to get started into some of these stunt shows in the theme parks or something? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know. Theme parks are always auditioning, you know, there's a bunch of live shows, you know, that are always, you know, looking for new talent. You know, you have all those dinner shows in Orlando, uh, like you mentioned, Bush Gardens, they probably have a couple of shows out there. So, I mean, there's, there's just so many venues where you can reach out and, you know, audition. And, you know, if you don't make the first audition, take that, learn from it and go back, you know, six months, you know, six months from then or a year and go back and audition again. Don't let that audition, you know, hinder, you know, what you really want to do. Yes. And, and people have to be, you know, you have to be in pretty good shape. And I know for, um, when I first wanted to do acting, I, uh, ended up at universal and that's how I met Fi. He was at one of the stunt auditions. He handed me a, 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 a an invitation to one of his things. Well, it wasn't even a stunt audition. He was just there and I'm like, oh, what's this? Like, I didn't know anything about stunts. I'm like, oh, well, this looks like fun. I think I'm going to go because, you know, anything that would help me get into a show at Universal, I just wanted to be an actor. But I'm like, oh, a stunt actor. Oh, that sounds like yeah. fun. And if you're athletic, that's actually exciting and sometimes even more exciting than just a regular actor. And um, just going to workshops in your area, I think, is helpful and to get some good training from people like you guys who've done it for a while and, uh, and do it safely. I mean, and safely, yes. And, and so um, have you ever gotten like really hurt on any of your, on your gigs or? Um, to be honest, no. I mean, I've got a couple of bumps and bruises here and there, but uh, for the most part, it's a hundred percent safe. You know, we always do our calculations. We know the speed we're coming into, you know, we know all of that, you know, and um, everything is pretty much, pretty much 100% safe. And if it wasn't, I'm sure you could you could say, look, you know what? I I'm not feeling that. Maybe would you be able to decline? Maybe not. If it's a multi-million dollar, you know, you can't just be like, oh, sorry, I'm not going to do it, right? I don't know. <laughs> no, you're actually you're actually wrong on that one. Okay. Um, anytime you don't feel safe in a situation, anytime that you feel something is off you have the full right to say, hey, listen, this is not safe, whether it's maybe it's bad weather that's coming in, or maybe the wind is, you know, is not in your favor, and you have to do a high fall, and you have to take all those things into consideration, and if you do not feel safe, you have to speak up, and you have to say, listen, I, I don't feel safe at this point of time, maybe we can, you know, shoot it at a different day. Unfortunately, that Southpaw, it was the last, you know, martini shot of the day, and I said, I couldn't put it off any longer. Okay, yeah, but that's good to know that you that they do protect you guys as stunt actors to to be able to say, look, you know what, I don't feel safe. Yeah, especially like weather. Let's just do it another day. And and like you mentioned, Southpaw, along with many other movies, take nine. People don't realize a two hour, two three hour movie, two and a half hour movie takes three months, two to three months to film, and that's just they don't even know while while you know the A list actors are doing their thing. The stunt people are on a whole nother set, usually doing yeah. their thing. And so it's it's crazy. So like how many hours would you say, I know they're usually long days. How many hours would you work as a stunt actor on say Southpaw or, or another movie? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, um, shooting definitely takes, you know, a little bit long. It's like a, probably three, four, five. I mean, they can last up to six months, but it's the preparation before that. So like even Southpaw, we were training you know, Jake and Jake was in the gym training even before we, you know, got to location. We were training three, four, five, six months before that. So you're almost talking a year to, wow. you know, to make a motion picture the time that you do all the pre stuff, you know, and then you get into filming. So it's a long time. <laughs> 
Wow, that is a lot. Like, like you said, especially when it comes to physically being physically in shape. So now going into that, how are you? Let, let me guess. Are you one of those guys that can just like eat anything and you don't have to worry about what you eat? Or are you pretty a clean eater? How, how's your dietary habit? Uh, do I have to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know they have, my listeners don't see you, but I, I know I've seen you in person and I know <laughs> you are lean and mean. You're pretty lean. So do you no, do you you know, especially now, you know, I am getting a little older, you know, but um, I do watch what I eat. You know, I hardly take in, you know, any extra sugar. Uh, I mean, that's the killer right there is the sugar. So um, I stick to a lean diet, you know, lean chicken, you know, lean beef if I, you know, tend to eat that. But everything is just, just lean, just lean. You know, you have your sweet potatoes, you know, a little bit of brown rice, and stuff like that, but also a lot of water, you know, water is key as well. For sure. Now, do you have like a, a routine that you do in the mornings on the days that you're filming for your stunts? Do you have, do you do like mindset meditation or like a little jog in the morning? Well, it's good. You know, as I, as, as I said, as I'm getting a little bit older, I actually started doing a lot more yoga too. And that's helped me stay very lean, um, lean and keep my flexibility. You know, being a martial artist, I was always flexible, but, you know, again, that age thing sets in a little bit, and uh, yoga has, has really helped me, you know, really stay in the moment um, and uh, stay flexible, stay healthy, um, and it just, it, it's kind of like my, my, my safe haven, you know, so in the morning, yeah, I do wake up, you know, I'll do my little meditation in the morning, maybe I'll stretch a little bit, but it's that, that that 10 to 15 minutes of quiet time in the morning, that meditation um, really has helped me. Okay, great. And do you do a lot of cardio when you're not tra when you're not filming? What are you doing in your off season to stay in shape? How's your normal exercise routine? Well, you know, I, I still do the kickboxing stuff. So I'll go to the gym and, you know, uh, hit the bag, you know, do a little bit of light sparring if I have, if I know somebody in the gym that you know, I can do a nice sparring match with and, you know, not get, uh, not get my face all um, <laughs> messed up. But um, light sparring, some jogging. Um, I've been doing a lot of swimming lately as well. Swimming uh, helps me stay lean, especially now that it's coming summertime and the weather's great outside. It's a great time to hit the pool. Um, and Okay, yeah. All right. Well, now I know that you um, are going, you're going to be transitioning and you're trying to do some more acting and more lead roles and things like that. And maybe trying to step away from the stunts a little bit. So I know, you know, with this whole COVID-19 thing, as we're filming this now, as we're recording now, we're still kind of at the, at a stay home, stay at home process. We're starting to open up some things here in Florida, but uh, let me ask you, how, how has that impacted your current or what was your current projects what were you working on and and what do you see coming coming up with that yeah well everything obviously everything all productions got halted at this time but uh, i was just on a new netflix series it's not out yet um it's called hit and run um you could find that on imdb it's listed there with all the actors on it but uh we actually shot that series backwards so it's 10 episodes so we shot episodes four through 10. We shot those episodes in New York City. And then recently after the new year, um, I was uh, had the opportunity to go over to Tel Aviv, Israel. And we shot episodes one, two, and three. Uh, the time when I was over in Israel, that's when the whole COVID-19 um, really started to ramp up and people were you know, afraid to fly and stuff like that. And um, so basically I was over in Tel Aviv for a short period of time and uh, they, they flew me out and they, they flew me home, which actually, you know, it was, it was good timing. So they flew me from there to um, LA, which I also booked the season finale of Lucifer. So I went from Tel Aviv over to um, LA, was getting ready to shoot this awesome character that I have on the season finale of Lucifer and then I think it was two days later after I landed in LA, Warner Brothers winded up shutting down. So we haven't even filmed that yet. So at least I have stuff to go back to. So then I left LA to come back to Florida because I had another project lined up and I was supposed to shoot a movie in Cape Canaveral. 
And then that one got shut down once I got to uh, Florida. So yeah, all production across the board has been halted. Um, at least I have these three projects to you know go back to when uh, everything gets back up and running. But uh, it's just going to take time to you know figure out the safety protocols and um, you know how we can shoot a safe film without you know anybody getting sick and. Sure. And I'm sure everybody's, every industry is taking, taking those precautions. They're working it out because they know they, they all need to get back to work, especially the TV and film industry. Yes. Uh, let me ask you this here. Now, it sounds like, was this, um, you played the romantic lead in a film, 116 McDougal or something? Is that right? Or? Uh, McDougal. Uh, McDougal. Okay. So yeah. tell us about that. So, so you were one of the lead characters or? So yeah, um, we actually haven't uh, started filming yet. We're in pre-production on that. Um, and that kind of got behind a little bit too, but it's based off the Gaslight Cafe in McDougal Street in New York City in the 1950s. Um, and I auditioned for the, uh, for the movie and I wound up landing the lead role. Uh, I play a character called John Mitchell and he was the owner of um, the cafe. And it's that whole era of the beatniks, folk music, um, you know, all that jazz, you know, jazzy finger snapping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was okay. that era. And um, it was a safe place where performers could come and they could perform. So John Mitchell, you know, wanted a safe environment for singers, poets, writers to come in, you know, and just express themselves. And you come in, you have your coffee and, you know, you listen to the acts for the night. And, um, but the city, New York City, the mob and the police, they tried to shut them down because they didn't really know who these beatniks were. They didn't know what beatniks were. They didn't like all this finger snapping, jazzy, you know, um, but it, you know, it's a real historical place because it's where um, actually Bob Dylan came into the Gaslight, you know, at 19 years old and he started performing there. And, you know, that's, you know, it's the whole era of Peter, Paul and Mary, you know, uh, Puff the Magic Dragon, uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. So all this stuff originated from this um, from this little cafe. And it's a story that really needs to be told. It's a really, it's a really family-based story because it's about this guy, John Mitchell, who was there really just to protect his kids, you know? And his kids, you know, he had hundreds of kids because all of his performers were his kids. And um, again, with the whole New York City and the mob trying to shut him down, no, he didn't like that too much. So then you have that rivalry between them too, um, throughout the you know throughout the movie. So we're in pre-production for that right now. We just did a live theater performance. We did an hour and a half uh, performance at the Carnegie uh, Carnegie Mellon Film Festival over in Pittsburgh. Um, so you know we had a bunch of you know our investors um, in the audience. It was a sold-out show. Um, so we were able to perform that. And then, you know, everything else that's happening now, we kind of had to put that on hold, but that's going to be coming out soon as well. Okay. Well, that does sound very interesting. So we'll have to keep our eyes open for that. Now, for the people out there that are listening that would like to be into, get into acting more so, um, do they need to, obviously there's union and non-union and you can't just just say, hey, I, I, I want to get my SAG card. There's There's work that needs to be done. How does somebody do how do they get on the process of acquiring their SAG card? Is there a certain amount of hours and, and things you have to work and projects you have to work to get that? Well, yeah, you know, you have to be on a SAG uh, production movie um, in order to do that. And, you know, hey, listen, I started as a background actor. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. That's where you actually learn. So just think about getting paid to learn. Yes. Um, you can't beat it. Uh, but if you're working on a SAG project, you want to get three vouchers. You, know, you have to get three SAG vouchers and then you're automatically can join the union. Okay. But there's also another way that you can do it. Uh, let's say you're on set and they need, uh, they need a guide to say a few lines. Maybe they didn't cast that role. And then all of a sudden the, the director comes up to you and says, Hey, listen, I want you to say, you know, get out of here, man. And you're <laughs> like, all right, yeah, I'll say that. Well, <laughs> they just gave you lines on a SAG movie. So then that production automatically has to tear partly you or put you in the union. Um, so that's another way to do it. A great way to do it is commercials. 
commercials is um, is a great way because they're always upgrading. They're always upgrading uh, background talent, and um, it, it's a great way to make money. You know, and hopefully you get upgraded at the end of the day. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. I wasn't ever sure how to go about it when I was dabbling in acting because I was doing it in Florida and I couldn't remember. I was never really on on any feature films per se. So that would have been cool if you could get into that situation. So it's kind of like that. In that case, it's almost like luck, but it's not just luck either. It's putting yourself in that opportunity, right? Even as a background actor, you know, you might think, oh, you know, I'm not that important. But like you said, if you're like a cool, like if you're like behaving like you should, um, when there's certain, you know, protocol, I guess, for even background actors. But if you're, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you could even have an opportunity, right? You just never know. Yeah, I mean, that's what I tell everybody. It's all about putting in the work. Um, and you might not see the results right away, um, but you have to put in the work. You know, being an extra on on set, that's putting in the work. Mailing your headshot, your headshots out to casting directors, that's putting in the work. Uh, joining up for all these acting websites where you can submit yourself for projects, that's putting in the work. Um, and going to work and putting in the work. You know, I have, there's a funny story that I um, that I recently told one of my buddies. I was actually in L.A. working as an extra. And I was there to do my job. I was dressed up in a cop uniform and everything. And I was talking to the head producer, the main producer of the show. And we're talking a huge, you know, a huge series. Um, and I'm just talking to them, having a good old time. And they were like, okay, our shot's up. We need, you know, our extras, you know, to be in the background. I actually had to tell that producer, hold that thought. I have to go back and do my job. And I left them standing there. I went, I did my job as a cop. I walked up and down the street. I, I did what I had to do. Five years later, that producer remembered me. He called me up and he gave me, he offered me a job right away. Wow. So that's what I mean about putting in the work. You know, show up, be professional, be on time. Yeah. I mean, don't be late. Oh. You know, be there 15, 20, even 30 minutes earlier. Um, and just do the work because the work will, you know, will speak for itself. And that's what I tell everybody. Your work will speak for itself. And just even, like you said, being on set and making those connections, if you do happen to have a conversation with someone, you never know if it could lead to something else in the future. So, but just being aware of your surroundings and a lot of people, if, you know, you're, you're, if you're supposed to be going to on set, a lot of times there's roads that are going to be blocked off. You might not know where you're going to park. I mean, hopefully they give you good directions, but you got to know, especially if it's being filmed outside, you got to know where to park. It might be a long walk to get to where you want to go. You're not going to yep. just walk into a building and say, here I am. So it depends on the location. You should allow at least a half hour. With me, I'd probably allow like half hour to 45 minutes just to make sure you get parked okay. You know, if you, uh, for us ladies, if we got to reapply our makeup or do something like that, uh, you know, things like that. And just be relaxed so you're not already stressed out running to the set trying to figure out, oh, where am I supposed to go? <laughs> oh, gosh. And listening to the producers and the directors, right? Okay. Listening to the directors. Do not start walking away and get in the shot accidentally. Oh, boy. That's the first thing to do to get yelled yeah. at, right? <laughs> Oh, I've never done that. I don't think. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I have some fun stories to tell too. Oh gosh. So let's see what else. So um, any other advice you want to give to people that might be looking as far as how do they find agents? I mean, other than, yeah, sending their headshots to different people, what do you recommend? How can they get a video? Should they get like a demo reel getting ready to do that? Well, the first thing I tell everybody is, if you're not in this game for the long time, for the long haul, then it's this is not your game to be in. Um, it's, it's all about longevity. And if you don't have the longevity to be in it, you shouldn't be in it. Um, because it just takes that long. It takes so many years to build relationships and genuine uh, relationships that you know, if you if you're already putting a two or three year, you know, if I'm if I don't make it by then then I quit. If you already have that, if you're already saying that, then I wouldn't even, 
think about um, getting into this business, but longevity is the game. Being in this game for the long haul. Yeah, there's some actors, I forgot which one, uh, one of them really didn't get their first major lines until they were like in their 50s. So yeah, and yeah. now they're big time actors. So yeah, okay, cool. Now what is your, this is the Cultivate Your Success podcast. What is your definition of success? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, for everybody, it's different. You know, it could be money. It could be, you know, status. It can be this. For me, success is putting out goals. And they're not necessarily huge goals, but they're little goal goals along the way that you can meet and accomplish. And I've put those goals out, you know, whether it was, you know, starting off at martial arts and just getting my going from a white belt to an orange belt, those, those kind of goals. Um, and once you reach the orange belt, then you go on to, you know, your purple belt and reaching, you know, putting out goals that you can reach. You have to work hard for them. But for me, reaching my goals is always the definition of success for me because there's always going to be another goal. So success never stops. And if you could just keep on that track, you know, it, it goes, you know, back to like even fitness, you know, after the new year in January, everyone goes, well, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to lose a hundred pounds. And then they're at the gym for, you know, eight hours a day for the first week. And then they just get totally burnt out because that's a, it's not a healthy way to do it. Make small, you know, reachable goals, reach that goal and just, you know, keep building that path. And for me, that's what success is. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. Goal setting. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, I wanted to, to real quick here, go back to real quick to uh, what I just mentioned just a minute b before. Morgan Freeman didn't appear in a movie until age 34, and he didn't get his big role until age 52. So yeah. I, I tell you, like you said, being it for the long haul, I know I didn't have any patience. I was done after a few years. I'm like, you know what? Peace out. This isn't for me. <laughs> but good for you and, and other actors. Uh, man, I applaud you all. And you're blessed that you had your, your background in martial arts and you were able to get into stunts. And uh, it seems like fairly, would you say fairly quickly? How long did it take for you? Like you said, you did background work. Uh, did you do that for a while before you got stunts or you pretty much started with stunts first? Yeah, no, I, I was able to um, get my SAG card for uh, doing a movie uh, down in Florida. So I got my SAG card right away. But it's not that easy. You know, it took me years to build up to get that opportunity. And then I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. Now I got my SAG card. I'm going to go out to L.A., you know, and I'm going to be, you know, just working like crazy. Well, <laughs> it didn't work that way. I went out to L.A. and now I was in a bigger pool. You know, there was more competition. So I, I literally had... I you know, took a couple of steps up the ladder. And then I, you know, I said I had to take a step back and, you know, do some background work and make my connections and, you know, learn uh, again about, you know, being on set and what to do and what not to do. So I, I was grateful for that opportunity because I got into the business and then, you know, I, I went and I did my work and I did my background work and I really learned and made those connections. So, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't easy. Okay. All right. Well, do you have any other last words? Otherwise, uh, I know we can find you on Instagram, mainly Dave. Uh, what's, how, how can they find you on Instagram and follow you? Oh, yeah. It's just my name, Dave, D-A-V-E, last name, B-U-G-L-I-O-N-E. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys have any questions, you can message me. You know, I can give you some advice. Um, they can message you and you can get in touch with me as well. Um, and, you know, we can keep that communication open good and if there's any directors producers out there in the area they can uh, find you by your imdb role is that right your yeah all my information is on imdb uh my agents my managers so if you just you know click on that link you'll be able to uh, be in contact with them um and they set up my schedule and you know take care of all that for me well, it sounds like you've already got a full schedule as soon as this whole uh, thing uh, lifts, the COVID-19. So again, remind us, what can we be on the lookout for once uh, these productions get back into play? Tell us again one more time how we can see. Oh, it's that new um, Netflix series called Hit and Run. 
which uh, we still haven't finished uh, production yet. Uh, the season finale of Lucifer. Um, I have a movie coming out uh, over here in Orlando that we're doing, uh, which is still in pre-production. Um, and the new Hollywood um, series, it's a mini series that just came out on Netflix. Uh, I have a, a little mafia role in episode five. So that just got released uh, May 2nd. It's a Ryan Murphy film. Uh, it's called Hollywood. It's a little mini series. It's a great mini series so check it out awesome and then one more time i know you were on southpaw and i remember watching the movie you were the main stunt actor for the main fighter right is that correct yeah i was uh, jake gyllenhaal's stunt double okay cool and and oh gosh i i just love i love these action movies and and you were on the accountant is that correct yeah yeah i was i played little tony how you doing <laughs> uh, with ben affleck <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll be on the lookout for that. So listeners out there, watch some of these movies and enjoy the action. All right. So thank you so much, Dave. This was a lot of fun. It was so good connecting with you again, and I'll see you on the big screen. Okay. Thank you. See ya. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye.